Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. You know, September means everybody gets revved up again. We try to reestablish routines, right? Uh, It's a great chance and opportunity for us to look in the mirror and remind ourselves what's really important in life. It's also a moment maybe where you reassess and you, you reassess about what you're all about. And that's no different for One Church CO. You know, I, Shelley asked me this weekend what I was speaking on. I said, you know, this weekend I'm excited to share with the church family because this is why I got into ministry, what I'm speaking about this weekend. This is why I do what I do. This is why I'm not doing other things, and there's lots of great things to do in life. But it's essentially the message I'll share with you today. You see, at One Church CO, we're all about the gospel. We're all about the essential message of Jesus that we believe can change anybody and change anything. And there's a great story in the older part of the Bible that illustrates this really well. It's about a Syrian general. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. And if you have a copy, I'm going to spend a lot of time in that chapter. If you have that available, you can jump on our free Wi-Fi or if you're online, just Google it. You can find it there. But it's a story about a Syrian general named Nahum that goes to the God of Israel to get help. Now, you need to understand, Nahum has some real barriers to getting to God. One is the Israelites and the Syrians hate each other. Uh, Syria had invaded them, had conquered uh, Israel, and so there's a lot of animosity. For, so for him to go to Israel to get help meant he had to humble himself. It also was offensive to the Israelites, <laughs> There's another barrier, too, to this general, and you're going to see this in a few minutes, because he was special. He was sophisticated. He was successful. Those very things we love in this life actually are barriers to him finding God. Let me pick up the story. Chapter 5, verse 1, it starts this way. It says, it says this. Oh, you know why? You know why you didn't jump to that? Because I forgot I wanted to play a little game with you. Because, you know, sometimes we hear these ancient stories and we look back and we think, well, what's the relevancy today? So I thought I'd play a little game with you. And so thank you for not turning the slide. (laughs) This is the game. I want you to guess the famous Torontonian. Guess the famous, I'm going to show you a picture of a famous Torontonian and I want you to guess it. Now, this first one, I think it's a layup. This is a layup one. Can you guess this Torontonian? Not the llama. Well, his name's there. I shouldn't have had his name there. Well, you know what? Maybe all their names are going to be there. I'll have to cover them up. Uh, his name is actually, uh, this is Aubrey. Did you know that? Aubrey Drake Graham. Now, if you don't know who he is, I don't know where you live. Because he might be the most famous Torontonian at the moment. He has outsold every recording artist. He's the greatest selling recording artist, only second to the Beatles. That's it. Bigger than Michael Jackson, bigger than Rihanna, bigger than Elton John, bigger than Elvis. You know, so big deal. So he's a famous Torontonian. Good job. Let's see if you can get this next one. Oh, oh, you know who it is? It's Simu Liu. So if, I don't know if you know him, but he's famous in Canada first for the sitcom Kim's Convenience Store, right? Then in movie, he did a Marvel movie, and more recently, he did the Barbie movie. Yeah, he did the Barbie movie. So he's a famous Torontonian, a great actor, also a writer. This next one, I'm going to guess that maybe they're over here. So this next, oh my goodness. I should have went through this beforehand, eh? <laughs> uh, this is the most famous Canadian author in history has the most accolades of any author, international awards. She wrote a little thing called The Handmaiden's Tale. I haven't read it, but anyway, she's famous. Do you know who she is? You better. You better because you can read it. I'm sure the next one's on this side. I'm positive it's got to be. So this next person, oh my goodness. Anyone know who he is? John Wick. This is John Wick or Neil from The Matrix. 
He grew up in Mississauga, Ontario. He's one of the biggest blockbuster Hollywood stars, but he's a Torontonian. These are all Torontonians. This last one is from Scarborough. Oh, whoa! Look at this. Do you know who this is? This is The Weeknd. Four-time Grammy Awards, Super Bowl, halftime show, has a falsetto and vocal range like few people ever. Incredible singer. So for Naaman to go to Israel to get help would be as surprising as maybe one of these five slipping into the back row of this church to listen to a sermon every week. You'd be going like, what? What's he up to? What are, what are they doing here? The weekend's on the worship team. What's going on here? And Margaret Atwood is sitting in the back. I don't know if Margaret would go. I don't know where she's at. But it was that big of a deal. It was that hard to get by that far to recognize that these people would be a part of this. Naaman would be the same thing. Naaman was an unlikely candidate. He was too successful. He was too powerful, too famous. But you know what Naaman's, one of the qualities Naaman had that I think a lot of Torontonians have? Naaman was a self-sufficient person. And when you look at Toronto, Toronto's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you're viewing from somewhere else in the world, this is an eat-what-you-kill type city. Like, it's, it's, a, it's an aggressive city, a competitive city. There are self-sufficiency built into people. And sometimes you can wonder, what relevancy does Jesus possibly have to Torontonians? I mean, what brings a name into God? What brings a, an accomplished person or an unlikely person to follow Jesus? How do you follow Jesus? Well, there are two factors in the story of Naaman that really illustrate what we need to experience and understand if we're ever going to follow God. So if you're going to access the God of the Bible, these are two things. Naaman had to come to a place, and we all have to come to a place where we realize that self-sufficiency is a lie. It's a lie. Look at how it starts out here. Naaman comes, and this is verse 1. Now we can get to the story. Naaman uh, says this, The king of Amran had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Amran great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. It's a very interesting literary tool here used. This is one sentence in the original language. And why it was one sentence is they wanted you to know you can have all this stuff in life, and life can still give you a right hook and lay you out. It can still. He's a successful general. He's a powerful person. He has an excellent reputation. He's wealthy. And Naaman has leprosy. He has leprosy. Right from the beginning, we learn this. You can build yourself a designer life. You can put yourself in some kind of designer life. You can put it all together, and it will always be ruined by something. No amount of wealth, no amount of power, no amount of sex, success can make you impervious to illness, to death, to uh, relational betrayal, to financial disaster. None of it can. It can never make you impervious. Think of the most self-sufficient person you can think of. Think of the most self-sufficient. One, some of you admire. At some point in life, they're going to be out of their depth. At some point in life, they're, the, they're going to get thrown into the deep end of life. And it's there you realize, not only am I not in control of my life, it's there you realize, I was never in control of my life. I was never really, it was an illusion. It was an illusion. You know, I, I think about it when I was young. Some of you might be able to relate to this. When I was in my early 20s, I thought I was invincible. I did. Like, it, it might be one of those foolish young men type things. I thought nothing could hurt me. I felt indestructible. Even when I got injured doing sports or stuff, I bounced back like that. Like I thought, and you know, it's interesting. Dr. Gary Wank, a neurologist says, the reason why younger people feel immortal is because their full frontal lobe is not fully developed. It's not fully matured. <laughs> so, so when women, they fully mature, the frontal lobe fully matures at age 25. What age do you think men fully mature at? 48, someone said. <laughs> it's, it's age 30, actually, age 30. So he goes in his article, he talks about the fact that, like, at age 20, there's different levels of maturity. It's just the way we see. The frontal lobe understands consequences well. 
See, one of the gifts of aging is that you quickly realize that self-sufficiency is a lie. You, you realize it quickly as you age, don't you? See, aging doesn't have a lot of gifts. That's one of the gifts of aging. There's other gifts that just, <laughs> just tear away at your, your confidence. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Every one of us who feels self-sufficient, your bubble will be popped. Someday it will be from something outside of you, like Naaman, it was an illness. Sometimes it comes from within you. The Greeks understood this, and the Bible teaches us that inside of every human being is a fatal flaw, a tragic flaw, that all of us have something wrong with us. Listen, I, I've been around people, thousands of people, through 30 years of pastoring, and I can tell you I've seen this over and over. I've seen a deep anxiousness in people. They don't want to let you see them sweat, but they walk around feeling like they're imposters. They're pretending. They're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I've seen people walk around. I've, I've seen this. People who specialize on nursing grudges and grievances. And they walk through life with this deep-seated resentment in life. They've got a chip on their shoulder so large. I've seen people in life so proud. This is sometimes the hardest people to, to connect to the gospel. So proud, so stubborn, unwilling to take advice. I've met many people who believe in Jesus with deep-seated addictions that actually control them in this life. And see what happens. One of those days, so one of those things that's inside of you, you can't contain it anymore, and it pops out, and it ruins your designer life. It ruins your designer life. It doesn't matter what kind of designer life you built. Something is going to ruin it. Why does something have to ruin it? You know what the gift in it, though, is often that's what it takes to wake us up, to wake us up that self-sufficiency is a lie. We can't rely on ourselves. And the second thing you'll see in the story of Naaman is also trusting in this world is a dead end. It's a dead end. So let's pick up the story a little bit. Because spiritual progress can't happen in your life. It couldn't happen in Nehemiah's life until he realized, until we realized, this world cannot deliver what you're truly looking for. See, Naaman is from Syria. And in Syria, he's a powerful man. He had connections. He had connections. He's connected to the king. He's connected to the most important people in Syrian culture. So he had connections. Naaman just didn't have connections. Naaman had a lot of money. He's extremely wealthy. You know, money can insulate you from a lot of pain in life. Not only did he have connections and money, he had power. He had expertise. He had a lot of skills. He was courageous. He had a lot of prowess in life. Naaman had a lot going for him, and none of it could help him. You ever seen someone like that? You ever been there? He had so much going for him, and none of it could help him out of the situation he found himself in. He's wasting away with the disease. He's at the end of his rope. And so he goes to Israel for help. Why? Because he hears there's a prophet in Israel that could heal him. So he goes from one king, the king of Amran, to, the, to another king, the king of Israel. But he doesn't go empty-handed. We read what he takes with him. He says this, So Naaman started out carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing, plus the letter to the king of Israel from the king of Amra. What's he doing? Well, he's going with what he had in Syria. He had connections, the letter. He had power and money, the gifts. So he's taking what he had in Syria to Israel with him. It's kind of interesting. The things that wouldn't work for him in Syria, he somehow thinks will work for him in Israel. I see this all the time. When people begin to try to follow Jesus or believe in Jesus, and they come maybe into a church community, and they want it to operate just like the power dynamics of the world that they've come from. It doesn't work that way. You're going to see that in a minute. Power is very different in the kingdom of God than it is in the kingdom of this world. So he comes. Why, why does he come with all those things? Because he wants to earn his healing. He wants to earn it. He wants to be able to buy it. He wants all of his success to mean something, to accomplish something for him. And why not? That's what got him ahead. It was always his skills, his prowess, his reputation, his connections, his money, his wealth, his success. That was always what opened doors for him. So why wouldn't he think this is the same way? 
But you begin to learn. He has to learn, and we all have to learn. You can't begin to make progress until you see that those things just don't work. They don't work. The world doesn't have what Nahum needs, and the world doesn't have what you need. The world will provide you with connections, with money, with power, and that's not what you need to find God. Look what happens in verse 7. Nahum discovers it. He goes to Israel. He brings the gifts. He brings the letter. And it says, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay. Why? Because he thinks, we're about to have an international incident. The king of uh, Assyria has just asked me to heal his great general. And he goes on to say, am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. He feels like you're just setting up for another invasion here. You know what's interesting when you read this text, though? Fascinating in this text. He tears his clothes because he realizes that, oh, wait, the king of Israel and Nahum think that the God of Israel operates like the gods of this world. See, every other nation, every other nation... The gods, the priests, the prophets, they were all employed by the king. They all bowed to the king. Religion was a way to control the people, and the king hold the, held the purse strings. So every prophet was employed by the king. Every, every priest was employed by the king. The gods served the king. And he says, they don't understand. You've come to the one place on the planet, the one place where there's a real god. And the king bows to this God. And the prophets and priests do not answer to the king. He's in a rock and a hard place. Oh, you think, now why would Naaman go to him though? Remember at the beginning of the story, Naaman hears there's a prophet in Israel that can heal him. Why wouldn't he go directly to the prophet? Because Naaman understands how power works. He's going right to the top as he understood it. I'm going to the one who's the employer of the prophet. Because if the king says, heal me, he'll have to heal me. And all of a sudden, he comes up against the value of the kingdom of God. It doesn't work that way. You might feel like you have no connections. You might feel like nobody knows you. You might feel like everything's stacked against you. I don't have the accolades, the degrees, the success, the, the, the wealth that other people have. And you don't understand how it works. You don't understand you're already his favorite. Yeah, but you don't understand how bad I am. You don't understand how it works. You're already treasured. You're already valued. You're already important. Why? Because you're the Imago Dei. You've been made in his image. So he comes to this king and this king is freaking out because he realizes they don't understand how this all works. They don't understand how the kingdom of God works. And here's what happens. So the king says, listen, hey, I do a lot of good things around here. I do a lot of things. But what you're asking me to do, only God can do that. You see, the world cannot help you. And Nahum had to come to that point. Oh, and you went to all the, all the powers, all the courts of power, and none of it could help him. If you're going to find God, if you want that life that will lead to freedom we sung about earlier, then you need to understand it only comes from following Jesus. Jesus is called in Scripture the way, the truth, and can you finish that line with me? And the life. There's an abundant life promised in him that can only be found in him. I love a great follow story. I love stories of how people will follow Jesus. I told you at the beginning of the message, this is what my ministry is all about. I love to see people connect dots by God's spirit and they begin to follow Jesus. In fact, I want to share two follow stories with you this morning. I'm going to ask two friends of mine to join me on stage. I'm going to ask Pastor Jessica and Pastor Stephanie if they would come and join me on stage. And uh, you can go ahead and welcome them if you'd like, but... So uh, just because some of you may be new, let me introduce these two to you, and I'm going to ask them a simple question. I'm going to ask you both, what was the catalyst for you to follow Jesus? 
So Pastor Jessica is one of our directional team members here at One Church Deal, and there's four of us that kind of give leadership to the ministry here. And Pastor Jessica is over, I, we always joke around, from the, gra- from, the birth, from the cradle to the grave. Birth to the grave is yeah, what we're saying. Yeah, from birth to the grave. <laughs> she oversees all those ministries, and uh, you know, I've known Pastor Jessica for years, and I worked really hard. I was thinking about when I was sitting in the front row. I don't know if I was convincing that you finally got on staff, because I or it I took just a long her time. <laughs> it took a I, lot I, I, I of I asked ass. her a lot to join me. <laughs> And then Pastor Stephanie oversees our entire next gen ministry. Yeah. So yeah. literally, that's birth to age thirty. Thirty. Yep. And what happens after <laughs> and thirty? Right? Is it all down here after thirty? Well, no. Then you're an adult. You're not next gen anymore. You're kicked then, out of young then, adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got it. How many over thirty church? feel young at heart? Yeah, come yes. on now. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there yeah. you go. <laughs> okay. So let's jump into this. I, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about what was the catalyst for you to follow Jesus. Share your follow story, and I'll start with you, Pastor Stephanie. Yeah. So my story starts. I mean, there there are different there are different markers in my story, uh, but it really started when I was in high school, in grade twelve. Actually, I was in grade twelve, and. Um, I was creative and inquisitive, um, but it, when it came to organized religion, that's where no, cre- that's where yeah, that's nah. where my creativity just like was like, oh no, thank you. <laughs> um, I grew up in a home where there was no organized religion like at all, and so it was something that was really really foreign to me. Uh, but when it, I was in my senior year, um, life at home was really really challenging. Um, my mom was in actually quite an abusive relationship, and so I I wanted to not be at home and thankfully I was at a school where there were a lot of arts programs so I would be at school in the arts department um, before school started and then like into the evening until the custodian was like you have to go home I'm like oh (laughs) all right Um, and so I would just kind of hang out there I just hung out there and it was really it was it was normal for arts kids to be around rehearsal all that stuff Um, and one of my arts teachers kind of picked on picked up on the fact that I was like there a lot (laughs) and she started talking to me and I started opening up to her and I told her just a little bit about what was happening in life and she took it upon herself to just share the gospel. (laughs) And uh, she shared the gospel with me. She shared about Jesus and I was like, Okay, yeah, thank you so much. You know, I'm just trying to be polite. And she's she, the one marking your papers. She's marking my papers. She's marking my stuff, so <laughs> I had to be kind of polite. Um, but I started getting a little bit curious about it. And um, one day she invited me to church. She invited me mm-hmm. to her church. And she's like, come on. I was like, no, thank you. Um, but she's like, well, I'm going to be I'm gonna be performing. I'm going to actually be singing. She was one of my music teachers. So I was like, okay, like I'll come. I'll come and watch you. And I came into her church, and um, I was, it, it was a really hard time, right? At home, it was really challenging. And I came into this space, into her church, and I could sense something different about mm. the atmosphere. You know, oh. we talked about the Holy yeah. Spirit today, and we talked about spirit. Like, I know that you are here. I know mm-hmm. that you are moving. And I didn't have the language for that. I didn't have the language to explain what that was, but I sensed something different about the space and about the people. It wasn't just a overarching joy of like, oh, everything's great, life is great, but there was something different about the people, and I like wanted that in my life. Wow. And so after the gathering, my teacher was like, so? And I was like, it was all right. Oh, it was all right. Too cool for school. Way too cool. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> let her know that I was like feeling stuff, <laughs> feeling things. So yeah, I just kind of was like, oh, it was fine. Um, and then it wasn't until I really hit rock bottom. I really hit a really dark place in my life. I was at this point I had moved out of home, so I was living on my own. And um, my teacher had encouraged me to pray. And you have to remember, again, it came it came from a home that like I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know yeah. what prayer was. And so I called out to Jesus, and I said, I always tell my kids a story, and I'm like, don't do what I did. But I gave in that moment, I gave God an ultimatum. I said, if you're real, I, I need wow. to, I need to feel you. Mm. And I did. I felt the Holy Spirit in that moment, mm-hmm. and in that instantaneous moment, I believed. Wow. I was a believer, but it took a lot of times with that church community, um, with people coming alongside of me to become a follower. Mm-hmm. And what's really cool about that story is her church is actually this church. Wow. Yeah. This church is where this whole story started. Yeah. yeah, it's really, really cool. So I was right over there in that corner over there. You are in that her, section? I was right there. Something special some good, about this some section. Good, Holy Spirit over here. So, so if, if, you, if you need to feel God, you might want to move yeah, from wherever you are over. over here 
and move into that section. That's what you're you saying. can stand up right now if you want to. <laughs> but no, it was. It's been really cool, and I've journeyed, and I've done so much of that journeying here in this community, and from believer to instantaneous believer. Because in that moment, I felt the spirit. It was undeniable. I knew that God was real, right. and that was really hard for me because I had no experience with that, right. and it took a, a long time before I came a follower. Thanks, Pastor awesome. Stephanie. Yeah. So, Pastor Jessany, Jessica, Jessany. share your Jessany. Can you share your story? <laughs> yeah, mine's very different, which I love. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I grew up in a very traditional Christian community. I uh, started going to church when I was very young. Uh, we went to church all the time, multiple times a week. Think back if you attended church in the 90s. We were those typical people that Sunday morning we went at 8 a.m. Uh, for pre-service prayer. 9 a.m. was Sunday school. 10 a.m. was service followed by some lunch, maybe a little nap, and then back to the church, 5.30 p.m. for pre-service prayer, evening service, and then that would go late into the night. So I spent a lot of time at church growing up. Now, my home church, uh, it, was, it was a really beautiful community. They really um, saw us kids as their kids. Mm. And not just the church kids, but what they did, I remember, I'll never forget, is they invested in vans to drive around our community and pick up kids to come to church uh, to experience Jesus with all of us. Now, they would pick up kids um, that parents would send because they didn't want them in their house on Sundays. They'd pick up kids that were there. Uh, That was back in the 90s. But our church was full of a next generation of uh, kids and students that this church community really invested in. So they they mentored us. They showed us how to follow Mm. Jesus. They taught us how to read the Bible. They taught us how to pray. I remember some of them were my coaches. Um, And so they really did invest in our lives. And looking back, Back, I'm just so grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful for the blessing it was to grow up in a church community that loved Jesus and followed him and taught me how to follow Jesus. But I can see now looking back that they didn't make me follow Jesus, though. That wasn't the catalyst mm. for my life. Mm. I remember going to high school. That was the first time in which following Jesus uh, like was all new. Because when I was at church or in public school, um, it was... Ve- easier to follow Jesus. They were more safe environments, curated environments. There was a lot of mentors around, a lot of my Christian friends. And so it was pretty easy to follow what I was supposed to do when I was younger. Come high school, um, there was this real struggle in me. So parts of me wanted to serve Jesus and follow him. Mm. And other parts of me wanted to serve me. Right and follow me and do what I wanted to do. And so I remember being constantly at war um, as a high school student of wanting to serve Jesus and also really wanting to do what I want to do. So what it looked like is during the week, I would do what I want to do. And then come Friday, youth would show up. You probably have experienced this. I'd show up, I'd go to the front, I'd be crying, asking for forgiveness. (laughs) I was living this double life and not really sure what to do. Now, In uh, the later years of my high school, I had a best friend who was making some terrible choices. And those choices ended up landing her in juvie, juvenile detention center. And I'll never forget, she called me one night from juvie, and um, she was sobbing on the phone, and she was, she was sorry for what, like, the things, the choices that had led to that. And she was just saying, I want to go home, and I can't. Mm. And I remember that was a real fork in the road moment for me. It was almost like you say you felt the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I felt the Holy Spirit in that moment showing me this, like, this is the path you're going down, Jessica, because I was making very similar choices and decisions that she was making. Um, I just hadn't landed down that path yet. And it was the Holy Spirit saying, there's, there's two options. There's a fork in the road. Mm. And it was in that moment that I think I f- had my first opportunity where I decided I was going to follow Jesus. I was going to try and it's a constant daily <laughs> choice of choosing his way over my way. Right. So looking back, I'm grateful. Uh, my church community provided me with a foundation to serve Jesus. They provided me my best opportunity for choosing Jesus. But in the end of the day, it was those fork in the road moments, that one, and then many that have followed, that I've just decided, you know what? Though I want to do things Jessica's way, I'm going to make a deliberate choice to follow Jesus with my choices and actions. Mm. I love that everyone's follow story is kind of unique, almost like a uh, fingerprint. And and everyone in this room, even wherever you may be spiritually and online, everyone's story is very unique. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe just talk to a little bit of what 
what difference it made in your life? Like, what did following Jesus, how did it impact the way you lived your life? Mm. So, Pastor Seven, you first. Yeah, well, it was very challenging for me when I first became a Christian <laughs> because it was so instant, and I had I had no idea what I was doing. So, I mean, this happened, I... I, I I became I became an instant follower after I did, prayed and I went to school grade 12 okay so just picture senior <laughs> year about to graduate I go to all my friends I've had for 4 years I'm like hey guys um I'm a Christian now so uh, they're like, okay, <laughs> like what? <laughs> and it was so, it was really they challenging. They must have loved you. They, well, we had, we had our fair share of arguments and I, to be honest, I, I didn't have a rule book, but I, I was getting information and this was before like TikTok and Instagram was crazy. Like in your face. So I was getting information from here and there. I was trying to research. I had never opened a Bible. Right. So I really was starting from scratch, right. and I read little tidbits of information of what a follower of Jesus looks like, of what someone who's following, following him looks like, and I did my best, but it was not... It was messy. It was messy. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone who's watching that was like, knew me in high school, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but it, again, it really wasn't until I like... I, I had a community come alongside me and build into me and I started reading scripture in, a little bit more intentionally and I started doing things like that where I started to really understand what it meant mm. to be a Christian. Man, that's a great illustration of how powerful community can be yeah. because community provides checks and balances yeah. and even balance to our teaching and that where we get our information from. So that's yeah. really neat. How about you, Pastor Jessica? Yeah, I was different. I had been given the playbook. So I, I <laughs> right. knew what I was supposed to do. I had and been taught. And it was really thick. And it was really <laughs> thick and detailed. Um, for me, the, uh, the change in following Jesus happens... Uh, this idea, I'm, I'm always kind of struggling between stewarding my life. This idea that uh, when, as a follower of Jesus, I'm called to invest everything in my life, my resources, my time, my treasures, into the kingdom, into things that will not pass away here, but will, that will take. So people, that type of thing. Um, I war at this idea often with this idea that Jessica wants to accumulate stuff behind her. Mm. <laughs> so this mm. idea that I... God has called us to steward our lives, mm. and I want to accumulate my life. And so that's just been something I've seen throughout my life. It shows up in what I'm going to do with my life. If I'm going to choose this path that will lead to this, or I'm going to be obedient and listen to the Holy Spirit and choose this path because he, he's called me to it. Mm. Um, it shows up in who, uh, I, when I was a young adult, who I was going to date. Was I going to date somebody and potentially go down a path of some, with someone who wasn't a follower of Jesus because the, there were people that I liked that I wanted to date, but instead I really, I, I warred with the Holy Spirit on that type of thing. Uh, it showed up um, parenting every day. Mm -hmm. This idea that I'm not in control of my children's life, that they have been given as a gift to me and I need to steward them well. But there, um, there's an aspect of God controlling their life that mm -hmm. Jessica's hands have to be off. So it really, for me, it's been that stewarding idea that God has given me talents, treasures, and resources, but he's asked me to invest them. And if I'm going to do that or just do it for Jessica. Now, the beautiful thing is you both arrived now and yeah. you're yeah. done. The work is over, right? Check. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Perfectly Fully formed, formed Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check, what... check, check. Where's the <laughs> certificate? Yeah. So uh, following Jesus is a, like an act of continual surrender. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so we, we, we're we launching Follow this weekend. Quite excited about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you did Follow last year uh, and you did the assessment, you need to redo it. We revamped the whole yeah. thing. We've changed it all. I would like you to talk for a couple of minutes of what it means to be in our follow program. Yeah. So Pastor, Je uh, Pastor Stephanie, first uh, follow next gen. Yeah. Okay. So I have, uh, I have a couple of numbers that are going to help us here. So if you're a parent in the room and your children are in our, in our kids wing, I want to let you know that you have 157,680 hours um, from birth to 18. 
That is how many hours that you have with your child. And some with young kids yeah. feel every one of those hours, yeah. don't you? you feel every, every it feels second. like a lot, and yeah. they fly by. Yeah, right. And so it feels like a lot. If, <laughs> let's say, for example, there's 52 weeks in a, in a, in a year. Uh, you come to church every single week. Every single week you're here, you're dropping off your kid from when they were in the infant room all the way until their senior high. Let's say potentially that that is the case. You don't miss, you don't miss a single Sunday, all right? Who's not missed a single Sunday? Hands up. Okay. okay. <laughs> Correct. Um, if that was the case, me and my team would have 1,872 hours with your students. Um, 1,000 hours out of 157,000 hours um, to be with your student to teach them what we can about Jesus. It's not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of time that we have with them. And what we were thinking about follow kids, we really were saying... We're, it's really not a lot of time. We don't get to see them a lot. How do we create active um, followers of Jesus? They're actively pursuing Jesus. It's not just about memory verses. It's not just about coming to church and learning the Bible stories, but it's they're actively learning how to live it out by mm -hmm. the at, at the age of eight, but also at the age of 18. How do we teach them that? And so we created a program. Um, we have a program that's uh, different for our kids, which is grade one to grade five. Our junior high is grade six to grade eight, and then our senior highs is grade nine to 12. And the, and the program scaffolds according to their development. So it gets, I just want to say if you're a senior high in this room, <laughs> it's going to be challenging for you, but it's such a good challenge. And, um, and the way that we've designed it is to really help teach our kids what it means mm. to be active followers of Jesus. Mm. So not just, oh, I know that Jesus says that all the fruit of the spirits are important. Well, <laughs> what do the fruit of the spirits look like in your own life? When you're dealing with someone at school who's a little bit challenging, what does it look like when we talk about the fruit of the spirit? And, and how do we actually do that? And mm. so we're really, really excited so about the program. If, if there's parents here that would like more information either online yeah. or in the room, how can they get more yeah, information great, about Yeah, great, great question. So if you are a parent, you can go to onechurch.to slash nextgenfollow, mm -hmm. and you can find the PDF versions of all three semesters for both kids and junior highs. Um, we also, it's a follow fair, so we have a, a, um, a table out there where you can see an example. But all kids next week are going to be getting a physical copy, a physical copy like this, and we're going to start with the kids. Uh, so we'll start with their booklets, their semester one booklets. Um, our senior highs, uh, it's a little bit different for our senior senior highs because we're actually having our senior highs sign a contract uh, they have it's a, it is intense and so they're going to be signing a contract to be a part of this program um, and so we're really we're really leveling up the expectation for our senior highs but we really do think that they're ready for it now what I love Pastor Steph about all of this is this idea that it's a partnership right absolutely um, yeah so there's going to be a senior a youth parent's um, information night. Yeah, tell a youth, us about that. Yeah, a youth parent information night next week. Uh, you can find it online. Um, and so that is going to be for our junior high program and our senior high program. And we're inviting parents to come out. We also have our parents for our senior highs also signing a contract. So uh, to just say, hey, I'm partnering with you as a church. Um, and uh, I'm going to use those hours that I have, those extra hours in the week, uh, to really s encourage our child to be a part of this program. And parents, adults, that, that's super important. When we we think of those numbers, 157,000 compared to 1,800. 1,800. Those yeah. are significant numbers. And let's be honest with ourselves. I have three kids. Me and my husband have three kids. Um, the primary disciplers of those three children, though I would love sometimes to pass it off to talented, qualified people, is myself. It's my husband. We are the ones that are going to show our children how to follow Jesus in partnership with what's happening here at One Church TO. And I shared my story. I grew up in a church community that invested in me. I'm probably standing on this stage because of people who were faithful, who decided to give up their lives and follow Jesus so that I could follow them. We as a church community want to be that for our next gen. We want to partner alongside of you and your team to give them examples of how we can follow Jesus and what that life looks like. So adults in the room, I'm going to invite you to take out your phones. Everybody grab your phone. I'm guessing most of you have you them. You have full permission. Full permission. But Pull out your Pastor phone. Jessica, a question. Yes. What if they've got a flip Nokia phone? A flip Nokia phone. If you have any type of phone that doesn't, isn't accessible, doesn't have a camera, that's fine. At the end of this gathering, our team is going to be in the lobbies and online to help you out. But if you're online, you're definitely going to have that. What I want you to do is I want 
want you to scan that QR code right now with your phone. Everybody, take out your phone, scan the QR code. It is going to take you to our website where follow, let me tell you about follow adult, follow adult. So follow adult is completely new this year. We are really excited about it. The adult men team, Pastor Steven, Pastor Brent, and their team have been doing so much work uh, with their team working on getting follow adult ready. Uh, really excited because we are going to be following Jesus both independently, individually, and also in community this mm -hmm. year. We know that the best way to follow Jesus is to do it together. And so we're going to be doing that. You're going to take that assessment right now. I'm going to invite you. You can start filling it out right now. Everyone in the church, we're going to ask online, in, in, in person, in the room, watching the seven-day replay, invite you to take that assessment. Our elders, our staff, our deacons have already taken it. We're all in. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to land you into a spiritual discipline. It's going to tell you one great next step that you can take over this next year to take a step towards following Jesus. And then there's going to be some really cool components about follow this year. We have some follow-up Sundays where you're going to be invited to actually be in community after a gathering online and in, in person that you can really start to talk about how your journey is going. There's going to be follow groups as well as there's going to be resources. Our team has worked together to curate this list of resources that will help you in your individual journeys with Jesus. I'm so excited. I wonder why don't we take the follow assessment for you right now? Would that work? <laughs> well, sure. you have no other option here. Okay, let's go. Because yeah. right. you're going to give you space to do this. So you, you do it too. You along go with ahead. Them. I'm going to take Pastor Steph through the assessment. All you right. make sure that you're filling it out right now. Okay, so what's your name? Stephanie. Yeah. Jones. Okay, very yes. good. Now the next question, email. If anyone in this church has any questions for you, yeah. any questions at all, yeah. what email should they send it to? Stephanie at onechurch.to. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, they've that, made that's it real a easy email here. to note down. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Phone number. I'm going to pass that. Why don't, yeah, or why yeah. don't we do the church Social number? insurance number. We will, yeah, yeah right? social insurance <laughs> number, uh, bank information. I'll just put it up on the screen here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> age, age category. Okay, we're getting real Under serious. Under 18, yep. no. No, no. 18 to 25? <sighs> no. Oh, that's like, Okay, don't that do me like dirty like that. Breath. Yeah, I know, it is. 40 plus? No, okay. come on. Uh, there has to be 26 something... to 35. Okay, yeah. Okay, that there one. Okay, something very in between good. There. Yep. Okay. How long have you been attending One Church TO? When was the time that you showed up in this room invited yeah. by your educator? Yeah. Um... Well, that's going to age me. Yeah, you're gonna gonna, be able to we already work know. Back. Yeah, we already I think know. 11 years. 11 years, six yeah. plus years. Excellent. <clears throat> 29. Okay. Sorry? The, uh, Sorry, I said nothing. I said oh. nothing. Oh <laughs> Move on. Being Question yes. Are you in a group? Yes, and I like am. A, that would be like a community, community group. group. Do you journey with people yeah, here at One I Church do. Fantastic, mm -hmm. yes. And I would describe my spiritual growth as, and there's a couple options, I'll okay. read them to you. Yep. Ste now, keep in mind, you're taking your assessment as we're going through here. Steadily growing and actively learning to live like Jesus. Okay. Making some progress forward. Not really growing, but okay. Or I'm in decline. Uh, I, I think I would say steadily growing. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Sure. And make sure you answer these honestly. It's going to really best. tell you exactly what the next best step that you could do in your journey. And I think it's important to note, Pastor Jessica, we're doing the quiz here now. If you had said maybe not steadily growing, your quiz, like, it, it's different, that, unique yes, for every absolutely. single person who's doing it This here. assessment has been built so that it's very unique to the person who's taking it. So you might see different questions than I'm taking right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Great point. Yeah. Would you consider yourself a follower of Jesus? Yes, no, or I'm interested. Yes. I would hope so. We <laughs> heard your follow journey yeah. story. So I lead the next good. gen, so I would hope so. Have you been baptized in water? Yes or no? Yes, I have. Actually, okay. in this room. In this room? Yeah. Wow. I was most recently baptized in water at age 0 to 10. Well, I'm going to guess no. No. Because you were no. in high school at least. 11 to 18 or over 18? I think I, I was 18. Over so 18. Can, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I would say... I regularly read the Bible, regularly read the Bible, mm -hmm. occasionally read the Bible, or I don't read the Bible yet. Ooh. I mean, be I would, honest. Yeah, no, I would absolutely love to say I read it regularly, but that would just not be true. That would, so you need to tell the truth. <laughs> yeah, I would say occasionally. You know what? Yeah. There have been so yeah. many seasons in my life. I go back and forth between regularly yeah. and occasionally. But okay. I would say occasionally. Well, yeah. you're at the end. I'm going to hit submit. Okay. What I want you to do is, and everyone to do this, as you finish the assessment, you're going to go look in your inbox. So you're going to open your email inbox. You are going to have received the results to your assessment See. right away in your inbox. Did you get results? Yeah, it's like right here. What are you going to be working on this Whoa. year? Open it up. So two things. As you open that email, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you'll be able to read through. There's a video, but scroll to the bottom. 
And there's a PDF. I am follow Bible. Follow Bible. So you are going to be journeying with people at One Church Geo, learning to read your Bible, learning to hear what cool. God is saying through yeah. the Bible. It's going to be an incredible journey. Steps one, two, three. I love it. So you're going to want to grab breezy, breezy. your assessment yeah. and your, your results. And at the end of this gathering, we're going to have next steps on how you can implement that in your life. Again, Very we're cool. really excited to be following Jesus as community. It, at following Jesus as a community this year. Can you thank Pastor Jessica and Pastor Stephanie? Uh, listen, uh, they're a power couple, really. <laughs> they're J- Jessany, is that what the Jessany, name is? Jessany, yeah, something like that. I yeah, don't know what we'll come like up with. Something like that. <laughs> Friends, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. And it's a process. And it takes time. And you never, there's no end date. There's no finish line. We're all in process. But if you're going to follow Jesus, and we learn this from the story of Nahum, You need two significant mind shifts in the way you see things, in the way you understand things. Otherwise, you might just be a spiritual person. You might just become a religious person. That might be what you are. But you won't find the God of the Bible, and you won't find Jesus. The two shifts are this, and Nahum had to come to this point. You have to make a shift from wanting help with your problem to wanting forgiveness for your sin. Hey, uh, Pastor Stephanie, Pastor Jessica talked about those moments where they hit walls, where they wanted help. They knew they needed help. That's okay. We come to God because we need help, because we want something, or we're hurting, or we're suffering. We come to God for those reasons. That's okay. But at some point, there needs to be a shift from wanting help with our problems to wanting forgiveness for our sin. You know, verse 14, damn finally gets his cure. If you're following along in 2 Kings chapter 5, he gets cured. He's cured of his disease. And in first, verse 15, he makes this incredible declaration of faith. He says this, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. That is unreal for a Syrian, for anyone outside of Israel to say that, you know, it'd be one thing to say, now I know that the God of Israel can heal a leper. It's one thing to say, now I know that the God of Israel is more powerful than, than, than our God. He doesn't say that. He said, now I know that there's no other God except for the God in Israel. This is an incredible declaration for this man to do. say. He went for a cure, but instead he found God. We all come to God for something, but I hope you find God. I hope no matter what you're searching for, in the end, you find God. Elijah is after, what he's after is not primarily to see Nahum healed. Because here's the thing, his suffering has got Nahum's attention. His suffering is causing him to wake up. It's starting to ha- cause him to drive him towards God. Nahum knows that, that uh, or, or Elijah knows that Nahum has a much bigger problem than his leprosy. It's all throughout the Bible. In Mark chapter 2, God, or, uh, some friends bring a paralytic man, a man who was paralyzed, to see Jesus to get healed. And they lower him through the... It's a very famous story. And, you know, when Jesus sees him, his friends want him healed. That's his biggest need, right? And Jesus walks towards this man on his mat and says, My son, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure his friends were like, Listen, Jesus, that's not why we brought him here. We brought him here to to walk again. We want him to be healed. And Jesus would be saying to them, you don't understand what his biggest problem really is. I mean, that's his obvious problem, but that's not his biggest problem. Our real problem is we don't have a relationship with God. Our real problem is the sin that creates a barrier between us and God. If we need to make a shift in our thinking to move from just wanting God to help us to wanting forgiveness for our sins. I know sin is not a popular word. I know in our, it's even offensive. But there are things that I have done that have put a barrier between me and other people, a barrier between me and God, and actually have harmed myself. And I can't work that debt off. I can't just work it off. I can't just do that. You need a second mind shift, though, too. You need a mind shift from thinking, from earning to trusting. You need a mind shift in the way you approach God, from earning, which Nahum tried to do, to trusting. 
Now, this is very important, and this is the heart of the message. Verse 11, heart of this whole story in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, Nahum says this, he gets very upset. In verse 11, he says, I thought he would surely come out to me. And what this is about is he goes to see the prophet finally. The king says, you're going to have to go see Elijah. Elijah tells the king, well, send him to me, send him to me. And Elijah doesn't even come out of his house to greet him. This is a very humbling moment, a very insulting moment for a powerful and important man. Now think of those five famous Torontonians. If they knocked on your door, would you not have them in? Come on in, Drake. Sit down. Let's wrap. <laughs> no. <laughs> you, of course you would. Elijah doesn't have him in. Elijah doesn't even welcome him in. He sends his messenger out with what Nahum should do. And this is really the beginning of a big lesson. Dr. Timothy Keller said it this way. He said this, The blessing of God is not for the powerful. It's for the humble. Elijah, secondly, doesn't conjure anything. And Nahum's upset. Look what Nahum does. He says, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord, his God, to heal me. <laughs> Nahum wants a spectacle. He wants a show, <laughs> like abracadabra type thing. And some of us get that way too. We, we already know how God moves. The right songs, the right moment, the right energy, the right passion, and then God can move. And Elijah gives him none of that because Elijah wants him to know this power is not coming from me. This power is not coming from me. Instead, Elijah says to him, he says, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. How does he respond to that? Verse 11, it says this, Nahum became angry and stalked away. Why is he angry at this? Well, look at verse 13. He walks away. All of a sudden, his entourage that came with him, because he's an important man. He's not traveling alone. He's traveling with an entourage. They say to him, sir. <laughs> I like that word, sir. We should bring that back. I like that. Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. Nahum's expecting to do something impossible to earn his cure. He wants something impossible. Like think of the most impossible thing in the world you can think of. Like, like the Toronto Maple Leafs winning the Stanley Cup. Like that's so impossible. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. That's the type of challenge Nahum wanted. He's a skilled, powerful, successful man. Give me something hard to do. And Nahum doesn't do it. And he's insulted. Why? Because anyone can wash themselves. Any weakling can wash themselves. Any child can wash themselves. Any immoral person can wash themselves. Any prostitute can wash themselves. Are you saying I'm just like them? Yes. But Nahum is a successful man. Nahum may have lived a good life. Nahum may have lived a righteous life. Nahum may have worked harder than most. He may have excelled further than most. He may have been more successful to greater degrees than anyone he knew. But Nahum is infected with the same weakness that every human being is. He's not better than anyone else. And this is the gospel. This is the gospel. We're all in it. And we all fall short. This is, the, this is why good people struggle with this and successful people struggle. Good people and successful people struggle because all of their righteousness, all of their self-sufficiency, all the things that make them special all fall short. They, it's almost insulting. They can't pay their own debts. They're so used to being able to pay their own debts at work, or everything. They always excel and all of a sudden they hit a wall where there's something so deep that they need grace. And that grace is free so that none of us can brag. Look what the Apostle Paul writes in this verse. He says, there is no difference between us. There's no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
The prostitute, yes. The, the child, yes. The weakling, yes. Nahum, certainly. You, me, yes. We all fall short. Salvation is received. It is not achieved. Salvation, what do you, but, but, but can I do something? There's only one thing you can do. There's only two things you can do, maybe. You need to admit you need it. That's what you need to do. You need to admit you need it, and you need to admit that you're lost. The world can't give you what you're looking for. Naaman's insulted because it's too easy. And his friends are trying to say to him, whoa, no, it's too hard. Because you have to affect, uh, accept that a great deed, a great task, a great dangerous thing was done on your behalf because you didn't have it in you to be able to accomplish it yourself. And it's only free because Jesus did it. He went through the fire. He went through the water. He hung on a cross. And all of the wrath of God for the injustice of the world, he was immersed into an ocean of wrath and justice. And he came through that so we could be like Naaman. We could be washed. What do you have to do? Get washed. What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So I'm going to close with this. You know, uh, yesterday, Shelly and I, my wife, we were driving down Queen Street East. We had just gone to the beaches area of Toronto. If you're watching from somewhere else, it's just a beautiful part of Toronto. And we were driving down uh, Queen Street East, and I was listening to music, and I was playing it, and an old hymn came that I have on a playlist. I have all these old hymns that I like that are done in modern ways. I really enjoy them, but there was a line I had to stop the music, and I just said to Shelley, that just gets me every time. And this line says this, our sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Friends, not in part, but the whole. Everything I've ever done, whether you've journeyed like Pastor Jessica and you grew up in the church, listen, your righteousness is but filthy rags. It all falls short. Whether you're coming in the side door later in life like Pastor Stephanie, it doesn't matter. You're, all your accolades and success or your power or what you do in your career and your work, and everybody respects you there, you got to get down in the same mud we all do. Because we're not better than, we all fall short then. And this is the gift of grace Jesus offers each of us. So I want to pray with you today to follow Jesus. I want to pray with two groups of people because there are some, maybe you're watching online, you're in this room, and you're a believer in Jesus. But you'd have to admit you're more religious. Maybe spiritually. Maybe you're still coming to Jesus for what he can give you. But you're not acknowledging that you need forgiveness. Maybe it's not changed the way you've lived. He's been an additive in your life. Not an essential in your life. Uh, well, why not at the beginning of this fall? Why don't you recenter yourself on the person of Jesus? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, today could be your day. But but Pastor Jonathan, I need to get a few things in order. No, you don't. But Pastor Jonathan, I I don't understand. Listen, it takes one step, one step in faith. And you do it in community and work it out as you go. None of us have arrived in this room. All the perfect people left a long time ago, guys. It's just us. And such as we are, Jesus accepts us. That's the free gift of grace. But can I earn it by giving? No. Can I earn it by serving? No, you can't. None of those things mean anything if you've not firstly given your life. So I want to pray with you. I'm going to invite you. If it helps you, you can bow your heads, whatever you want to do. I'm going to give you words. You can use them. But these are not my words that Jesus wants to hear. It's your words. So we sang about it early. Jesus' spirit is in this room. He's here to meet with us, so let's pray. Father, we come to you today with gratitude in our hearts 
for what Jesus has done for each of us. And God, we thank you for the gift of grace that was purchased by Jesus. And we humbly come to you. We acknowledge, God, that all we can do is admit we're wrong. Admit that we need your grace. Admit that we're lost. And if this is you, friends, do that. Jesus, I admit. I need you. I admit that that my pursuits in life, my success in life, all those things, God, all fall short. There's something that this world cannot offer me that I know I need. So I come to you today and I ask you to forgive me, to wash me, to clean me up from the inside out. Fill me with your spirit and renew and transform me. And for those of us in this room, you've been around church for a long time. Maybe you've had pockets where you knew you were following, but you're not really doing the follow work right now. You're, maybe you just believe in God, but your life doesn't mirror that. Sometimes it's harder for us. And it requires even maybe more humility to come to God and say, God, Forgive me, God. I don't want to just believe in you. I want to follow you. I want to love people and forgive people the way you love and forgive me. I want to be generous with people the way you're generous with me. I want to be redemptive and grace-filled the way you're redemptive and grace-filled with me. I want to be patient with people the way you're patient with me. I want to love others as you love me. So today, God, I reaffirm, I am a follower of Jesus. And God, I pray that that would transform. And God, I invite your Holy Spirit to convict me. If there's areas of my life that look nothing like following Jesus, forgive me. Friends, I just sense there are some people, you have some struggles going on in your life right now, and you think the other person's the problem. And you're sure that this situation's the problem, and it's preventing you from looking at the fact that you may have a problem. You may have an arrogance or a pride or a selfishness inside of you. I, I don't do this often. I'm just sensing there are people that you're there. Don't project onto others what what the Holy Spirit would say to you today. Maybe it's just time to humble yourself and just say, please forgive me, God. I want to get this right in life. I don't want to get to the end of my life and try to wrap it all up then. I want to live a life for you, God. I choose to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time. Thank you.